In our first module, we will review fundamental equations for dynamics and discuss factors influencing the growth of tropical convection. We will then discuss one of those factors in more detail, the importance of environmental moisture for cloud growth. Synoptic scale motions can be approximated in the mid-latitudes using quasi-geostrophic theory. In the beginning, there were three equations of motion. The momentum equation, shown here in two-dimensional form, the mass continuity equation, and the thermodynamic equation, in which Q represents a heating rate in units of Kelvin or degree C per unit time. One of the first things you learn in mid-latitude dynamics is that the atmosphere is approximately in geostrophic balance above the boundary layer. This means that the Coriolis force balances the pressure gradient force. This assumption can't be made in the tropics, however. Why not? Let's look more closely at the momentum equation. We can't assume geostrophic balance because f is approximately zero. Recall that f is proportional to the sine of the latitude, and the sine of zero is zero. Also recall that to be able to assume geostrophic balance, a very small Rosby number, say less than 0.1, is required. The Rosby number is just wind speed divided by f times a length scale, so as f goes to zero, the Rosby number gets big. On planetary spatial scales and away from the equator, we can roughly assume geostrophic balance, but most of the phenomena we discuss in this class are much smaller in spatial scale than order 10,000 kilometers. This means that all three terms in the momentum equation are similar in magnitude and that none of them can be neglected. Next, we'll consider the thermodynamic equation. Diabetic heating is absolutely crucial to tropical dynamics. For many first-order approximations of QG theory, diabetic heating can be neglected, although it does become important when considering how the vertical gradient of heating affects the evolution of geopotential, and when considering ageostrophic motion such as along a front. When removing diabetic heating in QG theory, we are left in the thermodynamic equation with a balance between the Eulerian temperature tendency and 3D advection. In the tropics, however, upward motion is largely driven by latent heat release associated with the condensation of water or latent heat uptake by the freezing of water. Furthermore, horizontal gradients of temperature in the tropics are small, unlike in the mid-latitudes where colliding air masses along fronts give rise to large temperature gradients that make up the advective terms in the Lagrangian derivative and make them large. In the tropics, u dt dx and v dt dy are small, and the time tendency of temperature is primarily a balance between the diabetic heating and the adiabatic cooling associated with upward motion. To first order, the two balance each other outside of the atmospheric boundary layer, and the time tendency of temperature is zero. This is known as the weak temperature gradient, or WTG approximation. Several factors work jointly to impact the growth of tropical convection. A few are listed here. Perhaps the most important factor is the availability of moisture, especially outside of the atmospheric boundary layer and below the zero degree C level. A dry atmosphere prevents the growth of convection via entrainment. Static stability and surface fluxes of energy are other thermodynamic factors that affect the buoyancy of updrafts in moist convection. Wind shear and low level convergence are dynamic factors that impact convection. Some recent research suggests that wind shear can dynamically alter the buoyancy of updrafts, but it may also alter the structure of isolated moist convection, such as to make updrafts more likely to entrain environmental air and become less buoyant. Wind shear through a deep tropospheric layer is also involved in the organization of convection into laterally expansive mesoscale convective systems. Finally, Low-level convergence in the lower troposphere can provide additional upward forcing for updrafts to overcome thermodynamic convective inhibition in the environment. For the remainder of this module, we'll focus just on the impact of moisture on vertical growth of convection. The relationship between tropospheric moisture and precipitation is well documented. Two recent examples of the relationship and observations is shown here. The panel at left is based on ground-based radar and weather balloon data, and the panel on the right is based on satellite-derived retrievals of humidity and rain rate. 
On the x-axis are column relative humidity, which is described by the equation at the bottom. The column relative humidity is the integral of specific humidity through the atmosphere divided by the integral of saturation specific humidity, which is a function of temperature. If the atmosphere were completely saturated, column relative humidity would be 1. The figures here illustrate two important points. First, below CRH of 0.6, where it is circled in blue right now, significant rain rates are rare outside of isolated cumulonimbus clouds. Second, an exponential pickup in the rain rate on average occurs around CRH of 70 to 80 percent. That's seen in both figures. Third, while large rain rates can occur at large CRH higher than about 80% or so, there are many instances of little to no rain occurring in what is a very moist environment. Therefore, we can say that a moist atmosphere is a necessary, but by itself insufficient condition for widespread heavy rain to occur. This might happen because the other factors that are important for deep convection to form are unfavorable. Perhaps the environment is too statically stable, or perhaps there is insufficient low-level forcing to support deep convection. The reasons for the scatter that you see here in all the different rain rates at the same value of CRH is still an active topic of research. Let's take a look next at a very idealized sketch of a cloud. This cloud has a parent updraft that extends through the center of the cloud. It is surrounded, the cloud is surrounded, by a moist but unsaturated shell where mixing between saturated cloudy air and the unsaturated environmental air occurs. So why does a dry environment inhibit the vertical growth of clouds? The process through which environmental air from outside a cloud is brought into a cloud is called entrainment for which the AMS glossary definition is shown here. I won't read the whole thing, but you can pause and read it if you'd like. Air inside cloud updrafts gets diluted with cooler and or drier environmental air, making the updrafts less buoyant, thereby reducing the upward acceleration felt by the updrafts. We'll walk through the basics of what this process looks like mathematically next. Let's consider the simple idealized case of continuous homogeneous entrainment. This means that the entire cloud feels the effects of entrainment in the same way. This is obviously a gross oversimplification, but it is sufficient for describing how entrainment of dry air, dry air inhibits vertical growth of convection. At the bottom of the figure is a cloud that exists at some time t and has some mass m and any variable related to the enthalpy of the cloud denoted by the scripted H. Subscripts C and E respectively mean cloud and environment. We could treat the scripted H as if it represents momentum, moist static energy, or moist enthalpy in the cloud. At the top of the figure is the same cloud at some time delta T later. You see that the cloud expands adiabatically. It has a new mass that includes the mass entrained from the environment and excludes the mass detrained from the environment. So you have plus delta M sub E minus delta M sub D. The new enthalpy variable is the original plus whatever change there is, delta H sub C. And that change is caused by entrainment. Finally, a source term, which is shown right here, contains all of the internal processes that cause a change in our scripted H variable. So for example, this would include microphysical sources or sinks, processes that would occur even if there were no entrainment or detrainment. For example, evaporation of liquid water would cause an increase in water vapor, or in terms of this equation, an increase in H sub C. So what we have here in the equation at the bottom is essentially the end mass of the cloud times the end scripted H value is equal to the initial value of mass times scripted H plus what comes in minus what comes out 
plus uh, sort of an integral of the internal changes associated with microphysical processes. So we'll rewrite this equation up to the top. If we did a little bit of algebra and took the limit as delta t goes to zero, we get that the material derivative of our enthalpy variable, the scripted h, equals the source plus a term that is proportional to the difference in enthalpy between the environment and the cloud. The final equation down here tells us that moist enthalpy in a rising updraft changes based on the balance between entrainment and internal processes. So this first term, big M, is just the internal processes, and then this second term is proportional to the difference in the moist enthalpy between the environment and the cloud. And here, moist enthalpy is defined. It's just Cp times T plus Lv times Q, so the temperature and the moisture components of moist static energy. Bring that last equation up to the top here. If we assume that a cloud updraft is saturated and has risen out of the boundary layer moist adiabatically, then it will generally be warmer and moister than the surrounding environment. Therefore, H sub C is greater than H sub E, and entrainment will tend to make the moist enthalpy inside the cloud decrease because H sub E minus H sub C would be negative. An environment that is cooler or drier than an updraft will tend to decrease the buoyancy of that updraft. Consider the definition of the buoyant force, which is shown here. Buoyancy is an acceleration that is proportional to the magnitude of the difference in density between some air parcel and surrounding air, which is what's denoted by rho prime. The 3D momentum equation tells us that positive buoyancy increases upward acceleration. This just means that if an updraft is less dense than its surroundings, it will accelerate upward. You've probably heard the notion that warm air rises. It does so because it is less dense than its environment and experiences upward buoyant acceleration. Consider how a change in water vapor concentration changes rho prime. A water vapor molecule is lighter than both molecular nitrogen and molecular oxygen, the two primary constituents in Earth's atmosphere. Therefore, a saturated cloud will always be less dense than surrounding air with the same temperature. That makes rho prime negative, and when considering the negative sign in the equation for buoyancy, that saturation, saturated air parcel experiences upward acceleration. Entrainment is a process that happens at small spatial scales in individual clouds. Therefore, numerical models of the atmosphere cannot resolve the process explicitly. It must be parameterized or described in a mean or ensemble sense across the entirety of some area much larger than an individual cloud. Because of the great sensitivity of cloud buoyancy to moisture, accurate representation of tropical rainfall in models is extremely sensitive to parameterizations of entrainment.